All right, everybody. My name is Dave Kuhn. I am from uh, College Planning America, and uh, uh, we, um, we're sharing some information with you guys tonight about college planning and retirement. If you have any questions, I'm going to encourage you to type in some stuff on the chat. And then when we're done at the end, we will, um, I'll attempt to answer some of those questions. And some of them we might do in, in private when we're done. But we're talking really about strategic planning for uh, college and retirement. I am a financial advisor. And so I work with a lot of uh, families with their financial plans and their retirement plans. And one of the concerns is that um, in some areas, people spend money that ends up costing them their retirement or uh, ends up reducing the amount in retirement. And so we try and make those areas as efficient as possible, college being one of them, because as you probably know, um, besides our homes, uh, college is one of the largest areas that we would spend money on. So, um, so as we uh, as we as we go through this, um, I'm gonna uh, just establish a couple of things. As parents, we would all love for our students to be going to the very best and elite colleges. Uh, and I want to say right from the beginning that I want this for your kids just as much as you do. So if there is an abundance of money in your household, then no big deal. Uh, but if there isn't, we want to make sure that we can protect the parents' future and give our kids the best future that we can. So that's going to be the, the goal here. Uh, moving on. So there are four major responsibilities and challenges for parents. And I'm going to go through a couple of these as we as we talk. The first one is uh, maintaining our current lifestyle. So, as as parents, we we try and maintain a, a lifestyle for our kids that um, uh, you know um, as we as we go through life, we uh, we we try and give them the best lifestyle that we can. Uh, but we also want to stay on track for retirement and. Uh, and as we, as we do that, we want to make sure that we've also got some funding for our kids for college and then also securing our family's future in case of unexpected circumstances. So those are really the four main responsible, financial responsibilities that we have as parents. Just because your student will be leaving the nest doesn't mean to say that they have to take your nest egg with them. And uh, that's what we want to try and prevent with this. So um, here's some stats as we, uh, uh, the, the fastest age group for college debt are 50 and older. And, uh, and then as we look at 60 and older is the fastest age group for student loan debt. Um, and so as we, uh, as we look at this, we say, oh my gosh, what is happening here? A lot of the parents, um, are, uh, uh, are signing up for a lot of debt for their students. And, uh, and so as we look at the fastest age group um, being 50, well, 50 and above, and, uh, and then 60, in fact, of the, the fastest age group in 60 and older, we say, wow, at this age, people should be preparing for retirement, not taking on new debt. So here are the five essential questions that every parent should ask, answer on college. And the first one is, who is paying for college? Is the parent paying for everything? Are we paying for everything? Or do we want our kids to have some skin in the game? Second question is, what do I think college will cost? So let me just back up on the first question here. Um, many of the parents have, uh, have not discussed this with each other. And so I would encourage mom and dad to, to ask this question of each other and saying, okay, well, who is, uh, who is actually gonna be paying for college? Let's get some agreement on that. And then what do we think college will cost? Do we have a number in mind as to what we think college will cost? And, uh, and then what impact does that number have on our ability to retire and live without being a burden on our kids? Have we actually done some math and worked that out? And then have we communicated that to our students? So part of this is to set expectations 
uh, with our students. So there's really two sides to this story. Uh, we've got on the one side, we've got parents and students. And on the other side, we talk about just the parents. And on the student side, um, we encourage students to do strength assessments to figure out what their natural giftedness is, uh, what their career should be, what majors they're going to need for that career, uh, and then what making a list of the schools that they want to go to, want to apply to, what are some of the scholarships available for that, and then what is the four-year graduation rate for that. And a lot of this is, is done um, with the help of your counselors at school or with an outside coach that many uh, parents get. Then on the parent side, we want to talk a little bit about what are some of the financial moves that I can make that could give me maximum financial aid for my personal situation? Is there a possibility of lowering my EFC? What are some of the strategic planning that we can do for this? And then when I talk about plugging the holes, it's like we wanting to fill this bucket for retirement. And, uh, and so what are some of the holes that we can we can fill if there's some holes in the bucket that are making it inefficient. Can we change that? And so always my question is, who's helping the parents? Is there anybody helping the parents on this side? And that's really what the purpose is. So when we talk about a fit for college, we talk about mapping it out. We use the acronym MAP. And the first one is to match the student's strengths and career choice to the school that they wanting to go to. Secondly, they need to be accepted at that school. And thirdly, somebody's got to be able to pay for it. And if all three of those are not met, then it's really not a good fit for your student at that school. Um, also having a plan means that we do not want to leave things to chance. Uh, we want to make sure that we actually have a plan. And, and it's the same thing when we buy a house uh, or any major purchase then we really ask ourselves, what's the goal of this purchase? What are our other options? How much will this cost? And what's the total cost after financing? How does that compare to the budget that we have? And what can we afford? And then how do we actually finance this major purchase? Are we making wise decisions? These are all things that we ask ourselves. And so the question I ask is, why is it different for college? Why don't we go through the same process when it comes to college, just because it's our kids? And so uh, why do families allow uh, many of the students to make these decisions that will actually affect the financial future of the rest of the family? If, we, if this was a, a vehicle that we're purchasing, would we tell our kids, go choose a vehicle regardless of price? And, uh, and if we wouldn't do that, then why would we do that for college? And so we really need to Put some more planning into this and not just leave these decisions up to our, our kids. So here's the key to success is really to have a plan. It's to educate on ourselves on these things and, and not just assume, and that's part of the purpose of tonight, <clears throat> then to understand some of these things. What is our financial category? What is my expected family contribution or EFC? We're going to talk a little bit about that. We get that when we complete the FAFSA form. Uh, what is the school's award history? Are there opportunities for efficiency in this? Are there opportunities for us to make this financially more efficient? And then does that match with our retirement plan? Uh, that's always a question I'm going to come back to is how does that fit in with our retirement plan? And then thirdly, we need to actually put that plan into action. So uh, what we want to do is just uh, not to not to guess, we've mentioned that. And then the secondly, we want to set expectations to avoid conflict. We want to make sure that husband and wife are on the same page, that the student is on the same page, that we're all setting our expectations to avoid conflict. The last thing we want is for our student to come at the, uh, at the end of their senior year, waving a, an acceptance letter from Brown or some other expensive college and, uh, and, and you know, with a $75,000 price tag, and we haven't had a discussion with them as to set expectations. So one of the things we want to talk with our student is who is paying, what's our budget, 
Can my student borrow enough? I want to just uh, talk a little bit about that because many times I sit down with parents and I say to them, how are you going to pay for college? And they say, well, my student has to get scholarships or they need to, they need to get loans. There is nobody that is going to lend your student enough to go to college. The most anybody would lend, the government would lend your student in their name is $5,500 in the first year, $6,000 in the second year, 65 in the third year and $7,000 in the fourth year. It's impossible for a student to borrow all the money for college. So the parents are gonna to have to chip in. The other question we need to think about is, are there other kids coming along? And, uh, and how does this affect our ability to put them through college? So we do want to encourage our students to dream, but we want to plan for reality as well. <clears throat> Here's some of the, uh, the, the, the four, um, four things that will bring us to the best strategy about paying for college. The first one is college selection and uh, and what are our majors and our career choices and can we be accepted and what's the price of that? The second one is, is there a possibility of financial aid? So there's different types of financial aid. We have need-based financial aid, merit-based financial aid, tuition discounts, special skills and negotiated financial aid. We wanna make sure we've taken a look at all of those. Then we also wanna look at our personal resources. What is our income? Uh, what assets do we have? Are there, is there any possibility of, of gifts from, from grandparents or other family members and, and then loans and where are we going to get those loans? And then some of the planning side, can we maybe get some tax credits? Is there a possibility of income or asset shifting? And then how are we investing our money uh, that we have planned for college and, uh, and where is that going to come from? So let's talk a little bit about our expected family contribution. This is often the first place that people go to when they think about financial aid. And, uh, and our expected family contribution is a very important number that we're going to get. And our expected family contribution is a number that we get when we complete the FAFSA form. And uh, we'll get to that in a sec. So you can know what your EFC is today no matter what your grade your child is in. So it's one of the things at the end of this webinar, we're going to offer an opportunity for the parents at Whittier to be able to um, link with us for a 90 minute uh, no cost appointment. And one of the things that we can do for you is even if your kid is a, is a freshman or a sophomore or a junior, we'll help you work out what your EFC would be today if you sent your student to college today? And is there something that we can do that could make that more efficient? So what is my EFC? My EFC, um, is it a fixed number? Uh, it's not necessarily a fixed number. It's a number that would change every year based on your circumstances and your finances. And it's often the first place that people will look for savings if we can make that EFC number more efficient. It might be adjustable, and this is used for both uh, need-based and negotiated financial aid uh, when we look at the EFC. So let's take a look about your EFC and what that means. It's my expected family contribution. It's the amount that I would have to write on my personal check before I can receive any need-based financial aid. And it's made up of seven different things. It's made up of your parents' income, parents' assets, student income, student assets, the number of children in college, the ages of the parents, and the number of people in the household. And then, very importantly, also your school selection, because there are different EFC numbers for different schools. We'll cover that in a sec. So here are the three different types of EFC. You have what they call the federal methodology, uh, which is used on the FAFSA form. We have the institutional methodology, which is used on the CSS profile form. And then you have the consensus methodology, which is used by a fewer number of schools um, that use that methodology. <clears throat> so here's how the school will determine how much need-based financial aid 
your family might be eligible for. So we have cost of attendance. This is, uh, when we look at cost of attendance, we, we really need to look at all of these. What is our tuition, our room, board, books, living expenses, transportation, um, if they, uh, this time of year, uh, are they going to be flying back for Thanksgiving? Are they flying back for, for uh, Christmas? Are we going to be visiting them in, our, in their college? Are we gonna be moving them into the dorm? We need to be looking at all of these expenses. So let's assume the school that we've chosen for tonight has a cost of attendance of $40,000. Then we go and fill out the FAFSA form and we get an EFC number of $20,000, just an example for tonight. And remember, I told you that the EFC is made up of those seven different things. <clears throat> so your cost of attendance minus your EFC would equal your financial need, which is the maximum amount of aid that a family may be able to receive as far as need-based financial aid is concerned. So you can also imagine if your EFC here was $30,000, then your 40 minus 30 means that you would only qualify for $10,000 of financial need. If your cost of attendance here happened to be $50,000, then you can see your 40 minus 50 would equal zero financial need. And so every family's, uh, every family's um, EFC is going to be different because these things are all different. Here are some financial aid myths. We make too much money to get financial aid. Our home is worth too much. Uh, public colleges are cheaper than private colleges. In-state is cheaper than out-of-state. Living at home is cheaper than living on campus. Getting financial aid is easy. And my student who is independent will get much more financial aid. Actually, all of these are myths because every family's circumstances are going to be different. They, their circumstances. So your neighbor who lives next to you, who has a kid in the same class, in the same school, with the same grades, applying to the same school might get different financial aid compared to your family who lives right next door. Let's talk a little bit about uh, these. If you have any of these types of funds, if you have any savings in any of these here, then um, I'm not gonna get into a whole lot of details tonight, but uh, what I will say is that perhaps you wanna talk to us because these could decrease your financial aid. And it's they possibly one of the holes in the bucket that could decrease your financial aid. So really what we wanna do is to just talk about that long beforehand to be able to see, are there things that we can do that, that could uh, make this more efficient? <clears throat> We're gonna do a comparison here tonight of a UC school, a Cal State school and a private school. And we're going to go through a couple of numbers. Now, remember, these are fictitious numbers. Uh, actually, they, these were actual numbers with a client, but um, we, we, uh, not all UC schools are the same, or not all Cal State schools are the same, and obviously not all private schools are the same. So we're going to just use an example of what this might be, a UC school at around $35,000, $35, a Cal State school around $23,000, $24,000, and then a private school for 57. You have a lot of private schools that are much more than that. <clears throat> if your student is a freshman in, in high school, then you've got to add inflation onto that. If they're a sophomore, or even a junior, you've got to add inflation. So um, once you add inflation onto that, then this brings that school up to 38, 26, and 63. Now for this particular family, their EFC, once we did an analysis, on the FAFSA form, the expected family contribution for the federal methodology, in other words, for these two schools was 28447. And for the private school that used the institutional methodology, it was $50,000. So you can see here that <clears throat> those two EFCs are different. And if you take your cost of attendance minus your EFC, 
will give you your need eligibility. So for this particular family, uh, they were qualified for about $10,000 worth of need at the UC school, nothing for the Cal State school because the EFC was higher than the cost of attendance and for the private school, $12,000. Now for this particular family, we were able to do some, some income or uh, asset shifting and work with them to be able to uh, improve this. Now let's take a look at typically how this works. Uh, so your need eligibility was $10,000 there. In this particular UC school, the average need met was about 88% of that $10,000. And of that, it was split into two. 79% of that was gift aid, which is free money, grants and scholarships. And 21% of that was what they call self-help aid, which is actually loans. Here you can see for the private school, it was 99% of the need met, and most of that was also gift aid and 21% in self-help aid. So if we go down to look at these numbers here, you will see the eventual cost for this UC school was $31,000, $26,000, and $53,000 there. When we talk about the immediate cost, that was because of without loans. And then we find out that the graduation rate for this school was 33% in four years, 12% from this particular Cal State, and for this particular private school was 90%. Now, not all Cal States are the same, not all UC uh, schools are the same. I specifically used the very lowest one, the very worst one here, just to show people what is uh, possible and that they should actually make sure that they're looking at different things. All right, so this was a family that we actually worked with. We were able to uh, shift some things around and we were able to lower their EFC and bring it down by $10,000. So this you can see here for the, for the Cal State school and for the UC schools, it came down by $10,000. And then for the private school came down by $23,000, which meant that the eventual cost of this UC school was $24,000. And so that was the actual savings uh, because we were able to, to, uh, to do, make some changes there. And then for the private school, it came down to $34,000. So you can actually see here that the UC school and the, state, and the Cal State school ended up being very similar. And the private school came down from $63,000 to $34,000. And then you look at um, the graduation rate and you say, all right, for that price, this school graduated 33%, this school 12%, that school 90% and it would help us make some wise choices. All this is information, which is really gonna help us make some wise choices. And then I wanna stress again, that each family will be different based on your expected family contribution. Uh, here's a report that we encourage parents to, uh, um, the parents who, who come and uh, um, uh, get some information from us, we can give them reports like this, which goes through all the different schools and give them all the different numbers of what this might look like. This school here, the estimated cost was $74,000. What I wanted to do is give you an example of what would happen if you had a low EFC. If you had a low EFC on that, that $74,000 school actually ends up costing you $22,000. Uh, for the uh, uh, this one actually was for, um, uh, uh, for UCLA, I mean, sorry, for, for USC. And then this one here was for UCI, and UCI would end up costing about $12,000 uh, there. Here you can actually see the graduation rate for those two schools. UCI actually has very good numbers. Not all the UCs are the same. But UCI has very good numbers on graduation. 70% of their students will graduate in four years. And you can see USC, 77, I mean, uh, yeah, 77% of their students graduate in four years. Let's take a look at the current rates. If you are thinking about taking out uh, loans for college, uh, we have on this side here, the student loans. Uh, we have subsidized and direct unsubsidized loans for undergrad at the moment of 4.53%. These are deductible 
the interest is deductible to the students. And uh, also same thing for grad school, but the interest rate is going to be higher. These loans here, the subsidized loans and the unsubsidized loans for the student, these are not payable until the student is finished uh, college, finished full-time college. The difference between subsidized and unsubsidized is that the subsidized loans, there is no interest while the kid is at school and the unsubsidized loans, even though there are no payments while the kid is at school, the interest will actually start running. And for parents, if <clears throat> now remember these loans here, uh, I said that the maximum they will give your student is $5,500 and then up to $7,000 in their fourth year. And the parents um, that get these direct plus loans, these are for parents or graduate professional students. The interest rate at the moment is around about 7.08%, which is actually quite high. And these are not deductible to the parents. And, uh, and these are all fixed rates and will not change for the life of the loan unless you can actually refi some of these again later on. And then also this is very important here is that they actually fees to take out those loans and take a look at what the fee is for the plus loans. So we wanna make sure that parents are getting loans from the right places at the best possible rates uh, to, uh, to make sure that they making this as efficient as possible. I want to just talk a little bit about 529 plans. It was kind of on that list of, uh, of assets that if you had might reduce your financial aid. Um, 529 plans are not good and they're not bad. It's a financial instrument. And uh, a 529 plan um, is the, 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 the value of a 529 plan is that if you invest the money in that 529 plan, the growth is not taxed if you use it for college. The downside of the 529 plan is that it could reduce your financial aid. So partly we wanna take a look at your individual financial circumstances, see what the effect of the 529 plan has on your financial aid, and, uh, and then make decisions from there as to what to actually do if you have an existing 529 plan. If you don't have an existing 529 plan, then we would encourage you to maybe talk to us if you're planning to have one, so we can actually see if that's the right plan for you. So here we're gonna talk a little bit about um, the cost of uh, from college funding, um, where we get the, the, the money from, and all our finances are connected. And just because we compartmentalize them, doesn't actually separate the consequences. Sometimes we have a savings account, we have a checking account, we have a brokerage account, we have an IRA, we have a 401k, we have a 529 plan, we have a, maybe some other savings account. And, uh, and, and just because we compartmentalize these doesn't mean to say that it's not our money, it's all our money. And if we, if we spend that, then it affects our retirement. So when we talk about college and retirement, uh, let's just imagine that we're here now, and that's where we want to be for retirement. Well, there's a couple of things we need to know as we plan for that. And there's some questions that I'm going to go through, which are actually the four vital questions that every person should ask their financial advisor. And college is in the middle here. So if we don't know the answers to those questions for retirement, <coughs> excuse me, then how do we know how much we can spend on college here? If we don't have our retirement plan in place, then how can we actually plan for college? Because we might end up there for retirement or if we've got two kids, we might end up there for retirement. So these two plans actually need to go side by side, our college plan and our retirement plan. So here are the answers to those four vital financial questions that everyone should have an answer to. What rate of return do you have to earn on your savings or investment dollars to be able to retire at our current standard of living and have our money last through our life expectancy? How much do we need to save on a monthly or an annual basis to be able to retire at our current standard of living and have our money last until life expectancy? 
if we doing what we're currently doing, how long will I have to work to be able to retire and live in my current lifestyle to life expectancy? And if I don't do anything different than what I'm doing today, how much will I have to reduce my standard of living at retirement in order for my money to last so that I'm not dependent on my kids in my old age? And uh, those are some of the questions that we help families answer. So as parents, I know that we would mostly, most of us would give our lives for our kids if it came down to that. My question as a financial advisor is, should we be doing that? What are we teaching our kids if we give everything that we have to them? Because remember, very often, if we spend all our retirement money on college for our kids, then we're going to make them, uh, we're going to be dependent on them when we're older. And, uh, and so we want to make sure that, we, that that's not going to happen. So if we can afford an expensive college and we are able to retire without uh, running out of money and relying on our kids for help in future, then that's wonderful. Go ahead and spend whatever you want on college. But if that's not the case, I try to get families to consider the reality and hear and see the truth with a plan. Sometimes it's, it's, not a, it's not a popular thing, but it's actually my job to help the parents because they will be helping their kids in the same, in the, in the same way. So let's just go all into this with our eyes open as we plan for college. And let's see, do I have the number in mind and of what the end cost will be after loan interest and inflation? <clears throat> have I added in all the costs for all my kids to go to college. And then sec uh, thirdly, where is the money coming from? Where am I going to get the money to pay for college? And if I'm taking on loans, where is the most efficient place to get the money? And can I actually repay the loans? Or am I going to end up in that age group of 60 and above, which is the fastest growing age group with debt, with most of it being college debt? So our focus really is, we're trying to fill the bucket and the bucket might have some holes in. Let's identify some of those holes so that we can make this whole process more efficient. Here's some 10 important things that parents need to know about college. Um, my student has these expectations, but I'm not sure if I can still afford to send them to that school. What are some of the discussions that I need to have with my student? Should I complete the FAFSA form? And, uh, and what is the FAFSA form? FAFSA stands for uh, Free Application for Federal Student Aid. And it's a form that we advise everybody to complete. And you can complete that form in, uh, from October the 1st of your student's senior year is the first time that you can complete the FAFSA form. What we do for parents is we give them an estimate of what that's going to be based on their current circumstances so that we know what we're getting into when we, when we do that. What is my EFC and how does that affect my cost of college? Which schools on the list that use the federal methodology and which use the uh, institution methodology? And is it possible that I can afford one and not the other? I wanna make sure that we, we, we're looking at all of those. Do I know the dollar cost of the colleges my student has on their list? Because the same school might be $25,000 for one family or $50,000 for another family. For your neighbor next door, who has a kid in the same school, same school with same grades going to the same school. Let's make sure we know what our family's dollar cost is going to be. What is the effect on my kids and my spouse of funding college and then running out of money in retirement. And by the way, this question here, um, what I found is that many students are much more sensitive to this than sometimes the parents even are. Sometimes the parents are just trying to do everything for their kids. And some of the, sometimes the kids are the ones that understand and say, no, I don't really need to go to that expensive school. And, uh, and they, they're just as concerned about their parents' finances as what we uh, might be. So let's talk a little about what are the number one and the number two most expensive things 
about college. The number one thing, uh, most expensive thing about college is going to college and not graduating. And uh, the number two most expensive thing about college is switching majors and switching schools. Currently, of the students that are currently in college right now, 70% of those students will spend more than four years in college. What are some of the things that we can do to prevent that or to minimize the chances of our kids spending more than four years in college? And that's part of what we would talk to, uh, to families about. <clears throat> and then have I considered the effects of the choices that I make from student one on student number two. Uh, if, you know, sometimes we, we families send their kid to college and they think, well, we'll just figure it out later on. And then they realize they actually don't have money for student number two and even number three. Uh, what is the new tax law and its effect on college financial planning? We can talk a little bit about that one. And then uh, this is very important. Do I have to accept the first offer that a, a school makes or can I negotiate for a better deal? The answer to that is it depends on the school, depends on your student, and depends on the, the, the preparation that you have done in your planning process. If you haven't done the preparation that would enable you to be able to negotiate, then it gets very tough. And so that needs to be um, prepared for right in the beginning. Uh, we spoke a little bit about the four questions every financial advisor should be able to answer before I actually choose a college. Then the last one here is what is one vital question that a school counselor cannot ask a parent? And the answer to that is how much money do you have? How much money do you make? Tell me about your finances. The school counselor, the reason I'm actually doing this presentation tonight for Rudia Christian is the, the fact that it's somebody outside who's a qualified, licensed a financial advisor uh, has the ability to go through some of these things here where your counselor at school is not going to answer these questions for you. And it's unfair to expect them to. So just a reminder again that there's two sides to the story. You have the side where the students will go through this process and then that side with the parents going through that process. And our question always is who's helping the parents? We try and help the families to cover all of these things. So here are five essential questions that every parent should answer on college. Who's paying for college? What do I think college will cost? What is our college number? And what impact does that have on our ability to retire and live without being a burden on, on our kids? And then have we communicated that to our student? Uh, so we've kind of come to the end. I will answer some of the questions if you want to type your question in. Uh, but if you'd like to schedule a no-cost 90-minute appointment, either online, on Zoom, or in person, feel free to reach out. That's my phone number. That's my email address. Just pop me an email, and, uh, and we'll schedule something. And, um, and we'll sit down and go through some of these questions that you might have, work out what your EFC is, Work out what the possibilities of you getting some sort of financial aid. It doesn't matter whether you're a freshman, a sophomore, or a junior uh, parent, um, or even a senior parent that wants some help. Uh, feel free to uh, to reach out to us. There is no uh, ideal time to start planning for college. You want to start as early as possible. The reality is we should start this long before we get to high school. But the reality is most people leave it until they get to high school. So um, if you have a freshman student or a sophomore student, don't wait until they get into their junior or their senior year. Now's the time you want to do that. Let's take a look at one more question here. The biggest mistake that people make. After I do this presentation at a number, I, and I deal with a lot of the high schools in Orange County, and uh, um, the biggest mistake that people make is that they think we cannot help them. And I don't know if I can help you too until we actually get to talk one-on-one -on -one and see what this, your circumstances are. And then we can determine if you're doing everything right, then I would say to you, fantastic, go forth and multiply and do what you're doing. And if there are things that we can do to help you, 
then we would be happy to, to show that to you. So just uh, reach out to us and, uh, and I'd be, uh, I'll be happy to help you. Let me take a look and uh, let's see here. Are there any, any questions that anybody has? Doesn't look like it. If you, if you have a question, feel free to, uh, to type it into, into the chat. This is recorded, so if you if you are wanting to um, uh, if you if you're wanting to uh, look at the recording later on or pass this on to a friend, then uh, I'd be happy to send that to you. Just pop me an email. Okay, and if uh, if that's it, then uh, we uh, we'll we'll stop um, we'll stop that right here. And thank you so much for uh, spending the time with us tonight.